morning everyone it's irene mtomba a, a disaster manager for the south african red cross Just gonna wait for three more minutes. We're gonna start at five past 10. Thank you for your patience. Thank you all for coming and for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mzivotolo Mayetwa. I'm the Director of Drug Prevention under Life Saving South Africa. And today is our last session uh, that we, after we have had a number of sessions, which, which, is, which is where we started with the episode one, episode two, episode three. And today is the fourth final one uh, in the first episode, I'm sure you, those who attended, you are aware that we started by introducing the terminology and the concept uh, of flooding, what do we mean by flooding, and, uh, and it was followed by where we covered four phases of flooding, where we spoke about the pre-flooding and the flash flooding, the expansion, as well as flood recovery. In the previous session, uh, we were more focused on on the technical aspect for how one can protect themselves using the protective equipment, where we spoke about flooding, hydrology, and personal protective equipment and flooding rescue. 
so we were very uh, uh, appreciative of our speakers who all spoke well and were able to assist us greatly in terms of educating us and sharing that particular information. And uh, now we will be speaking. Uh, we have other speakers again, Irene. I hope Irene, your, your, everything in your corner is all working. I'm gonna introduce Irene who will be the first presenter and then he will follow he will follow by Shane and Adrian. And when they will be talking about the education standards, because of uh, as much as that we are we are talking about all these particular aspects on flooding, how do we prevent ourselves? But there's also a need to actually educate ourselves, making sure that we are quite capacitated when we are dealing with these issues of flooding and all of that. And that will be the one of the key focus of today's session. Uh, Irene is the uh, Irene Mutombe. I'm going to hand over to you, who is a disaster manager, disaster management uh, from the Red Cross. Uh, Irene, I'm handing over to you so that you may share your presentation, and then we may start. And thank you for thank you so much to everyone that have attended. Irene, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Mzi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this. Mzi, are you going to project from that side? Or you want me to share from this side? You, you can share from your side, Irene. All right. I can Sorry, see Irene. You were sharing, it's fine. You can share from that That's end. Fine. Okay. Yes. All right. Perfect. Cool. So the South African Red Cross Society is involved in different disaster uh, interventions. And um, uh, our, our, our focus is not only on response, but uh, interventions with regards to uh, disaster preparedness. Uh, response and, uh, and, 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 and relief. So you, you actually, uh, you, the South African Red Cross in short sucks as we go forward. Um, it exists to augment government humanitarian efforts in times of peace and also a disaster crisis. So in times of peace, usually that's where we are involved in disaster preparedness, disaster mitigation interventions. So uh, we operate in all the nine provinces of South Africa and we focus on disaster management, health and care, uh, volunteer management, and training and development. So our, our training and development, that's when we, 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 we believe in imparting uh, skills, uh, life surviving skills like uh, first aid and um, uh, our volunteer um, management, we have uh, a, a number of uh, uh, some volunteers at the moment. We have 3,250 volunteers across uh, South Africa who are involved in disaster management training, and uh, uh, also others are involved in the current ongoing uh, COVID-19 response and vaccine rollout. So we, we, in disaster management, like I highlighted earlier, we focus on preparedness. So as you can see, that uh, was uh, during tropical storm Eloise and uh, uh, some of our teams, uh, they were in, 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 in different provinces, especially Limpopo, Pumalanga and uh, KZN, which were hit, hit hardest by tropical storm Eloise. I was part of uh, the team uh, which was deployed in, uh, Chakuma in Limpopo. So that um, picture is um, one of the pictures of the villages where we were in, in Chakuma. So prior to a uh, tropical storm Eloise, uh, we, we, were, we engaged the communities in um, uh, disaster preparedness in interventions, which uh, engaged, which in involved um, them uh, 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 making sandbags to uh, try to ensure that uh, the, 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 the water won't uh, flow to their houses. As you can see, that one was an example of uh, what was done prior to, to, to the floods. Um, 
then we, we also engage in a response where now during the, 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 the when a disaster or an incident occurs, we, in, in, we engage our teams in, in conducting rapid assessments and also a, a rescue uh, a teams uh, sometimes who will, will be involved in evacuate, evacuation um, initiatives uh, and we collaborate with um, the, the local municipalities and also some disaster management uh, uh, teams. Then a uh, part of our response, we also work closely with SADIF uh, and even during the tropical storm uh, Alois in, 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 in Limpopo, we had a case where uh, some villages were not accessible because the the the, the bridge in between the river be, between the village uh, it collapsed. So the, the 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 villages were not able to access some services. And um, uh, Sadif came in. Uh, they, they they came on board and they managed to um, uh, deliver the relief uh, items to the affected villages. We are also involved in recovery interventions where we believe as much as we can prepare our communities to withstand or bounce uh, back when disasters happen. But then if the disaster happened, then we need also to uh, ensure that after we respond, we ensure that we engage in interventions uh, of recovery to affected communities. So we also have a program which is called Restoring Family Links under disaster, our disaster management program. So this um, uh, 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 a project on uh, restoring family links, it uh, usually focuses on uh, people who are separated uh, during disasters or during incidents. Uh, and uh, they, they, they are separated from their families. So we, we have witnessed that even uh, last year when, when COVID-19 uh, started and uh, there were restrictions and also movement was uh, restricted and people were, were some people uh, could not uh, manage to reach out to their families. So we, 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 we offer different services like telephone services, tracing requests, the, we also have an application called TraceFS where uh, some communities can also uh, share the pictures and utilize that application to trace uh, their, their, their relatives. Uh, we also uh, you have the Red Cross message which uh, the, the affected person can write to their, uh, to, to their relative. They, they, they try to share the information where last do, 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 did they located their, their, their relative. Uh, if ever they have uh, the contacts and maybe sometimes they don't have a phone or uh, to, to, to communicate, then we can also assist some, we assist them with internet connections. And as we know, South Africa is a hub also for, for migration and refugees. So some, some of our, uh, of our, our, um, our beneficiaries, uh, they are also, uh, we also have some refugees and uh, migrants. Next slide. We, we also have health and care program as part of our, 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 of, our, of our interventions where we are involved and engaged in addressing um, some gaps in, in health and well being through health programs and nutrition and HIV and WASH. So, uh, like I highlighted earlier, to say some of these interventions, they, they, they prepare our communities to be able to withstand sometimes when disasters um, happen, looking at the epidemic itself, uh, the, the pandemic uh, COVID-19, we, we, we have seen a lot of retrenchments and many people being becoming unemployed and um, a lot of stress uh, uh, posed to, to, to communities. So our, our health and care pro program, it, um, it provides uh, psychosocial support to affected communities and individuals. It also uh, uh, promotes uh, in interventions and initiatives with regards to food security and nutrition. So uh, some of uh, the interventions, they are also, we also promote income generating activities, which we, we, we believe they, they, they assist uh, communities to withstand sometimes when shocks or, uh, or, or, or disasters happen. 
We also have WASH uh, initiatives where we, 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 we also promote WASH, uh, construction of uh, hand washing facilities, especially in institutions, in schools, in, in public centers, um, and uh, al also uh, to, to ensure that the, the communities have access to, 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 to water, which is safe also for drinking. So like I highlighted earlier, the South African Red Cross, actually South, uh, the Red Cross itself is, is, um, is a movement. It, it is a movement which is uh, characterized by dedicated volunteers. Like I said, in South Africa, we have 3,250 volunteers across all the nine provinces. Um, we, 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 we have trained volunteers who are trained um, mostly in life saving skills like first aid. Uh, some of our volunteers, they, 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 actually all our volunteers are rooted in communities and they are always eager to, to, to save their communities. So we also even have some volunteer, some of our volunteers, they are community members and others, some of them, they are also professionals who volunteer their time maybe after work, but most of them, they are also, um, uh, 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 the community members who are eager to, to save their communities. They are involved in community engagement of any initiative which we, 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 we might need to engage communities in. Next. So our, our training and development uh, uh, project, is, it, 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 it um, it aims to enhance skills and capacities of uh, staff and volunteers. So SACS focus on the following trainings. We have basic disaster management training, which is uh, offered to uh, all our volunteers. They are trained in basic disaster management. We also uh, train even the community members, especially community influencers, uh, so that at least sometimes when disasters strike, they, they, they have the basic skills to, 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 to respond better or even prior or before a disaster happened, they also uh, uh, they are also aware on um, initiatives which can which they can engage in in order to mitigate uh, disasters. We also have first aid like that picture there is showing one of our um, of our of our um, uh, trainers uh, who was uh, training some community members on 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 basic first aid. So we have different levels, first uh, level and second level. So we 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 also have um, uh, some trainers in in all the provinces who who usually train our our community members or our local disaster management forums uh, forum members to 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 possess uh, first aid skills. We also train them on vulnerability capacity assessment, where we 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 ensure that um, the the communities they have the skills in assess conducting assessments. Is especially on different vulnerabilities in their communities in order for them to be also be able to participate in addressing those, uh, those vulnerabilities. We also train, uh, offer training in community engagement and advocacy uh, to ensure that uh, community members, they, 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 they are involved. So it's more of uh, uh, promoting participatory uh, uh, initiative in, 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 in any interventions towards the communities. Next. So these are some of the intervention pictures when uh, you, you see our some of our volunteers responding to fire incidents. That one was in, 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 in Cape Town. Uh, uh, so sometimes when incidents like fires, they, they, they happen. We had uh, some fires in Boysen. We had uh, fires, uh, recent uh, deadly fires in Maimai where uh, some people lost their lives. So usually our volunteers who are mostly rooted in communities, they, 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 they become, uh, 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 they form part of uh, the first responders when incidents happen. So sometimes we, we also utilize uh, community radio stations uh, we, which are at our disposal. We usually engage with local radio stations to um, uh, 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 be involved in raising awareness, especially when early warning 
warning sometimes when uh, we get early warnings either from the South African weather service or is, 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 is sometimes uh, maybe when uh, we need to raise uh, more awareness on uh, any um, a disaster related or any community awareness which we would want to impart to communities. So we usually utilize uh, community radio stations. We engage with them and we have good relations to, 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 to engage them. Yeah, so the, the, the ongoing COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we, we have uh, some, um, uh, some mobile centers uh, uh, which uh, uh, in some some uh, provinces we also have uh, some testing uh, we have a testing center here in Kauteng um, where we, 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 we sometimes um, uh, engage and uh, collaborate with the Department of Health to reach also marginalized uh, communities like your informal settlements and, and some uh, communities which are uh, usually far or we, 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 which uh, usually find it difficult to, 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 to reach uh, health centers. So we, we also involved in outreach and uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, ambulances which have been assisting, especially in uh, hard to reach areas uh, to, to, to assist with some services. So uh, some, some, some of our trained volunteers, like I highlighted earlier, they are professionals. We have professional nurses who, are, who form part of our uh, uh, volunteers. Uh, they, 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 are, they, are, they are trained and involved in, in, in COVID response, the, 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 the testing. Uh, we also have uh, uh, some of our volunteers who are in the communities. They pr promote uh, WASH, um, especially with this uh, COVID-19. And we have uh, uh, some uh, donors whom we work with. We work with quite a number of donors who, who, who support us in different interventions to, to, to ensure that uh, we, 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 we uh, strive to fulfill our mandate. Thank you, colleagues. Any questions or clarifications? Thank you, Irene. Such a great work that you guys are doing from the Red Cross. Uh, I'm now open for the questions. Any questions that the members would like to ask, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah, good, morning. good morning, guys. Uh, this is Nkosana Mopena. I'm uh, based in Ekuruleni, uh, city of Ekuruleni, Chobe. I just wanted to uh, find out that uh, how do I apply to be part of uh, the Red Cross development and so on, since I'm a part of, I'm currently an, uh, an examiner. So we're dealing with uh, mostly disadvantaged uh, children of which that we wanna give the input, especially maybe have a core uh, working with the, uh, um, uh, 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 the, 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 the social workers, especially uh, as well as uh, people that who have been under abuse of uh, drug uh, religions and so that we can maybe engage towards them. So how do I maybe apply or get involved into with the Red Cross? Thank you. Irene. All right. By the way, you say you are in Ekurulen. Yes, I'm based in Ekurul, city of Ekurulen. All right. We 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 have um, our different branch offices uh, within Kauteng. We have uh, about ten branches. So uh, I think you can uh, reach uh, out to me on. I will share my number and also my email so that we see which uh, branch is closer to you, which you can uh, directly engage with, with them. We can recommend, uh, we can uh, establish uh, um, uh, 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 an engagement with uh, you in the local branch and we will always be there to, to, to ensure that maybe we see how best we can integrate and uh, uh, collaborate. So much, Ned. thank you. Thank you, Kosana. Any question? I see yeah. Job, the mic is open. Yes, uh, I think I was just asking Irene, what is the level of 
cooperation with Red Cross and South Africa, because at times when I look at my case in Kenya, it's kind of competing. <laughs> I don't know what's, what's, what's your experience there. Thank you. Oh, all right, us as the South African Red Cross, we, we came to know about uh, Life Saving South Africa. Uh, I think it was last month, if I'm not, I'm not mistaken, and uh, I already shared also with um, with, uh, with with uh, with our team as the as the SMT we, the, our interest to uh, collaborate with the life saving SA because we realized the life saving SA is also offering some life skills. Uh, uh, trainings which would uh, really want uh, to collaborate and engage more to so that we can uh, also see that uh, some of our volunteers they 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 they, they are trained so we will uh, look at uh, how best can we can leverage our our engagement with the life saving uh, sa and uh, i hope uh, we we will uh, uh, further engage even beyond this uh, the, this uh, uh, session uh, thank you, Irene. I see uh, Daya, your hand is up. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Program Director. I think uh, Irene has covered it somewhat. The whole purpose of these webinars is to develop these networks. And uh, as Irene has indicated, we certainly would uh, want to develop the networks with organizations like uh, the Red Cross, because we believe that on our own, we can't meet our nation's needs. Uh, we need to work collectively. And one area of, uh, you know, a, a, a common area that we can collaborate on with uh, uh, Red Cross is to do um, the, the education and training and to do the awareness. Because as you know, Life Saving South Africa is all about preventing. So if we can do some of these preventative campaigns, uh, in collaboration with Red Cross and municipalities and local government and other organizations like disaster management, then in some ways we are mitigating the risks. And I pause there, thank you. Thank you, Daya. Is, uh, Helen, is there any questions with, from the chat? No, there's just more uh, people asking for uh, more information about the um, South African Red Cross Society and uh, Irene has shared her email address and her contact number so anybody can go into the chat line can actually contact her and in the office directly so that they can get further information about where to find the various Red Cross offices. I know they've got one um, query about Rustenburg, um, we had the Ekurileni one so um, thank you very much Irene that was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure that there'll be a lot of inf interest from this. Yes, yeah, thanks. Thanks Thank a lot, Helen oh, oh. and Mzi, uh, for, for creating this, uh, the, this uh, platform where it will maximize our engagement as uh, humanitarian actors. As you know, no man is an island, and that is true. We, we, we need to ensure that we engage uh, more often and ensure that uh, we, 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 we know what uh, each one of us is doing so that we can uh, also minimize duplication of interventions maybe in the same community. But in, instead, we, 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 we maximize on, um, on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, imparting more skills to the communities so that they, 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 they possess life-saving skills. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Indeed, this is all about collaboration. It's all about working together. It's all about eliminating silos that are there because of the at the end of day, at the end of the day, it's all about saving the lives in the best way that we can do. All for all those who just joined now, it was Irene from the Red Cross who was sharing about the work that they were that they were doing at the Red Cross, and she has shared uh, her contact details and those who are interested to be in touch with her. You can just uh, look at the chat room. Uh, she has shared even her cell number to contact her if ever that you are interested in any community engagement, in, in, in volunteerism, in, in making sure that you are becoming part of the solution in terms of addressing all these particular issues that we are actually facing, uh, not only as a country, but as also as a, as a continent 
as well. There are many problems that we are actually facing, but without us working together, that means we won't be able to succeed. And I am sure there's so many other information that you would like to share, uh, but given the time, uh, and, and I'm sure you guys will be in touch with her. And now let's go ahead, and I'm now inviting Dr. Shane Baker to share the presentation and start uh, uh, his presentation. Dr. Shane, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you very much, Mizzy. Uh, it's very great to be here again, and um, thank you to our, our participants that have been uh, staying with us over the last, uh, what, two, uh, eight weeks. So it's been a, uh, a great effort by everyone for their commitment. Um, we've had some good speakers, and I think listening to Irene was um, a, a good way to uh, help introduce our final session and also, I guess, uh, reinforce some of the things that we've um, touched on as we've gone through, particularly in terms of um, using the community, um, being able to be able to respond to disasters, being able to call on people that have got some level of training. And I think uh, it certainly touched some very uh, important aspects of some of the things we've talked about. Um, just before uh, I start off on the presentation proper, um, we, we won't have as many slides as we've had in the past because we are keen to also hear from some of the participants out there because we know um, basically from the initial survey and also from your ongoing participation, we have a, a wealth of experience uh, that's out, out in this uh, virtual environment that we have. So uh, tonight uh, I have the pleasure of also introducing our, our chief researcher and motivator uh, Ms. Amy, uh, Dr. Amy Peden. Uh, uh, Amy's um, just going to give us a little bit of a, an update on the survey and also to uh, encourage your continued support of our efforts. Uh, Amy, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Shane. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to be joining you. I missed a couple of the sessions in the middle, um, but it's nice to be here for the last session. Um, Thanks to Shane for the opportunity. I just wanted to, I guess, thank everybody for their participation in the uh, pre-seminar series survey. Um, it was really helpful to get an insight as to um, the skills and the, the interests of the people that we were speaking to and how we could better refine the training sessions that followed to suit what you needed and what you were interested in learning about. Um, and I'm also coming on here tonight to say that if you could please give us 10 more minutes of your time. There will be a post seminar series um, uh, survey going out. Um, I think Shane will speak to it. We'll pop a link in the chat a little bit later um, and Helen will send out some information about it as well. Um, it's a, a little bit about um, helping us to refine training for future training sessions for South Africa, but also for other countries. Um, and just to get some feedback now that you've been to all the sessions or heard all the different topics, what you thought. Um, so if you could share a couple of minutes to do that um, once we send through the link, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and we're happy to share the findings as well if people are interested. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to hearing from you and I'll hand it back to Shane. Thanks very much. Now we'll uh, go on to the presentation. So I will start the slideshow. Um, and the disadvantage for me in starting the slideshow is I don't get to see any of the chats. So um, if need to be interrupted at any point, Mizzy, uh, I'll rely on you to um, inter intervene. So tonight's main focus is one of the topics that um, did come back from the initial survey from our uh, first session around the four types of floods. And that was uh, people inquiring about, well, what is the training? What sort of training is out there? Um, and also what sort of equipment? Because uh, many of the things we've touched on, we've emphasized the need. And also we heard from Irene, there's there's le different levels of training that's needed. Uh, and it's not just a matter of saying, well, as lifesavers, we can do everything and anything. Um, we're certainly well qualified. We're certainly able and fit enough to respond, but we really need to be guided and ensure the safety of not only the, the general public, but our members as well. 
So one of the statements uh, you'll see, oh, just before I, uh, you'll see the uh, link at the bottom there for the post survey. Um, I put that on uh, this slide and, and the last one. And as Amy indicated, it'll also be included in the chat session. Uh, this is a statement that came out of um, uh, the United Nations Disaster uh, Organization. And I used it in one of my introductory slides, and that is uh, about the urgency and the critical nature to be able to plan and reduce uh, the risk uh, imposed by disasters. And we know that uh, the flooding disasters, for example, the damage to infrastructure, and we heard that with Irene Ryan talking about the um, a disaster in uh, Limpopo and uh, where a bridge was taken out. So those sorts of things takes not only affects the actual disaster at the point of contact, but it also has a, a long-term impact in terms of uh, the community. So we know that these things are quite large. We also know that uh, in terms of the World Health Organization, that drowning uh, numbers from floods and, and other aquatic disasters and cyclones are generally not included in the data. So we know that there is a, a toll out there um, that generally is not being counted at this point in time. And for most of us that are involved in drowning prevention, uh, that's, the, that's a flag and that's a, an issue that we feel strongly about. And that's probably why most of us are here sharing and talking uh, as we have been for the last eight weeks or over the last eight weeks. Uh, as Mizzy indicated, uh, some of the topics we covered, um, our, our idea was really to um, share and, and encourage participation because uh, as Dai has already indicated, uh, there, there are opportunities as a country and organisations within countries to come together. So uh, we try to build up the information so that we increase the peop everyone's knowledge around uh, some of the terminology, some of the uh, actual impacts. And obviously up front was the four phases of flooding, which uh, thanks Mizzy's already touched on. We also uh, then moved into the actual response and the incident command uh, and the and Adrian went to uh, a lot of detail around the tempo model. Uh, we've also talked about the flood hydrology and the fact that how the water flows and how the water flows and the, and the actual dangers that are associated with flood hydrology that probably doesn't exist under normal conditions. Um, safety is always paramount because we're talking about humans putting themselves at risk to, to look after other humans. And as we know, with that, we need to have some standards, um, whether they're the higher standards or um, not is, is not really up for debate. It's really about having everybody trained to a standard that everyone can feel confident in their each and own, their own ability, but also their, their colleagues and their other people that they work with. Um, having that sort of confidence uh, can make the difference again between life and death as does uh, having equipment that's going to be able to um, be fit for the job and, and be able to provide the resources that we need. So tonight's um, uh, session, before I go into it, I suppose one of the other things um, that was asked uh, in some of the other areas, well, what are, what are the objectives? Well, uh, as we've probably heard, first of all, obviously, we want to make sure that um, when we talk about flooding and the sorts of things that can occur, that we have a common understanding, that we have a common terminology, that we can engage with one another as well as uh, the other organisations such as we heard with Irene, the Red Cross, and, and have, have a confidence that we can talk about the same issues in a way that's going to have a commonality in terms of our goals and objectives. Uh, having said that, um, one of the, I guess, challenges for all of us and, and prob probably the motivation for us, not only running this session, but when we ran the workshop actually in Durban um, during the World Conference or just prior, uh, is that as lifesavers, uh, the notion that there's an area of, um, that's actually, as we've also shared, um, an area where there's increased risk, increased frequency, and even now we've seen the impact of cyclone in, in India. Um, so the storms are getting bigger, uh, they're getting more frequent. There's more and more being published around 
the one in one in one hundred uh, storms that are occurring uh, every other year. Um, even in uh, Bangladesh, which we know is a, a country that's prone to a lot of flooding, uh, they have also highlighted that the frequency and the severity of the storms that they're now encountering is beyond what they've normally had to put up with before. And, and they've had to change not only their uh, lifestyle, but also how it impacts on their economy because it's changing um, their way of doing their, their business. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to talk a little about the training and um, I'm going to have to um, fly blind because I'm obviously just looking at a PowerPoint and um, so I'm going to use the prompts and maybe um, I can get a, a verbal comment or um, perhaps I'll encourage some verbal comments from anyone that would like to uh, make a suggestion. So when we talk about flood training or any form of trainings, there's usually a, a level of competency that we like to see developed. Um, so if we start at the very beginning, um, any suggestions, the sort of training that we're talking about, and, and we've actually covered some of that over, over the course of our four webinars. What's the very fundamental level of training that we most likely want to encourage or achieve? Any thoughts? Would there be a fitness requirement? Yes, indeed. Uh, fitness has got to, got to be a pre, almost a prerequisite, particularly for obviously any of the direct interventions in terms of swift water uh, and, and in terms of the rescue component. So again, uh, we have a nice synergy between uh, generally a lot of lifesavers who are active, who are fit, who are trained and um, who are doing more fitness work probably than the average um, fire and rescue person. No offence to anyone in that area. Um, but I think there's a, an expectation, particularly when it's in front of the water. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. I see a question or a comment from Jihan uh, Tuantek. Early assessment of the environment. Exactly. Um, uh, there's also. Yeah. 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 Uh, what I would say is Richard Water from Life Saving and Detail Rescue. What has been on the screen, it's important because is that um, awareness type of training, specifically for the lifeguards that will be involved in the swift water response type of teams. And that is based because in the awareness training, this is where the where they've basically been trained in all the components of at least your team operations, your assessment, your risk assessment, your different responses pertaining to the layout rescue plan and that. So I would say is that for like that for starting up in this environment, is your awareness that basically covers all this. And then we can build from there pertaining even to your like we, what we have in the South African context with your incident management systems, your ICS systems, 100s and that. Um, so this is my inputs pertaining to the question. Yeah, no, very great. Uh, very grateful for those comments and um, uh, very true. The awareness, uh, regardless of what level of uh, operations or response, we, we de definitely need to have a common ground um, so we, we picked up on that one quite well. And, and then, there's the, then, then there's the question of those responders and how those responders are able to respond um, based on their equipment, their training, the communication, um, those sorts of things. Any other uh, thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? couple of um, comments in the chat line um, you know your training skills um, risk assessments um, they, they've um, some some uh, levels of uh, criteria or performance that definitely comes into uh, the rescuer situation so the rescuers 
capacity to have those skills and uh, assessment are, are going to be critical, uh, both to the rescuer and the rescuee, totally agree. Jane, a list of bond here from KwaZulu-Natal Life Saving. Um, yeah, Hi. I'm listening to the comments and uh, yeah, they're sort of saying lifesavers are more competent to, to having this awareness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a few thoughts on that. Um, in the surf environment, yes, we're very aware of it. We know what to look for. We know what currents we're looking at when we know rescues in amongst reefs and rocky, rocky um, shorelines, we're competent there. But I think when it comes to swift water rescues, um, that is an area where I think the average lifesaver is lacking in, in as much as identifying the hazards, particularly like in the case of say water spilling over a weir, uh, knowing that you're going to get trapped underneath there, knowing where you can go in and um, this type of thing. So yes, lifesavers do have, a, have an advantage, but uh, lifesavers will still need to uh, refocus in as much as uh, moving away from the surf environment to a swift water environment. Yeah, and, and having the opportunity to experience some of those uh, different conditions um, is, is a, you know, is a critical component, isn't it? Because we can show the images and we can talk about it, but until you're actually in that environment, um, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's all theory, I guess. And very frightening when you when you're trapped in in in, in that environment. <laughs> yeah, and I, I put the uh, flood boat and driver, um, which is actually relates to that as well, because as we know, um, any of us that have operated or crewed in um, inflatable rubber boats in surf and uh, open water conditions, yes, we've got skills in terms of uh, maneuver maneuvering those craft. We've got skills of uh, lifting and getting people into those uh, craft in, in a, as a rescue situation. But when you're in a flood environment where you've got other you've got debris, um, all sorts of other hazards and those strains that we've touched on previously, uh, we can't quite operate exactly the same manner um, as we normally would. But it doesn't take away from us having some fundamental skills. Very true. Um, okay, a couple of comments in the chat. Thanks, Helen. Uh, from Lynn. Uh, public awareness of everything you guys have been teaching over the last eight weeks, not the detail, maybe, but what organizations are dealing with percent, potential disasters, what those disasters can potentially cost, and what organizations are equipped and connected to deal with um, these when needed. And the other comment was Ian Grant. Um, we need needing training simulations and, and training simulations if possible. Uh, yeah, uh, the awareness one is is a, a quite a good one, and I think um, you know as Di has been uh, and Helen have acknowledged uh, some of the work that's been happening. I, I think we also have to acknowledge uh, Life Saving South Africa for uh, taking the lead and and helping bring people together in the way that has happened. Um, because I think that's part of it is, because I think a lot of the organizations that have uh, been represented have uh, obviously working very hard. And, but as we've attempted to highlight, um, the situation is that such that when there's a disaster, it's a lot easier to um, have those resources on hand up front rather than after it strikes. Um, so if, if those networks can be built uh, as a result of this, it's also a positive. Um, so the and the, the other parts then that leads into that coordination is that tactical planning, which again we we highlighted is so important. So that the organisations are coming together, they have a clear, a very clear and concise map of the skills and capabilities that are out there. Uh, that the training is ongoing, um, like like it is with any of our um, existing training. We all have annual expectations in terms of fitness uh, capabilities, first aid, CPR. Uh, those sort of first responder skills, as well as our um, uh, equipment handling. So they're sort of um, some of the things that we, I, I just check, I think that was, uh, or any other areas. Um, I think we've raised a few of the other areas. I mean, I didn't list the fitness, but I think the fitness issue, um, um, perhaps we haven't talked about it, but it certainly underpins a fair bit of it because um, 
Adrian and I have certainly touched on it and explored it in terms of some of the other services that are out there, that we do have a, again, a nice strong platform with fitness levels of uh, lifesavers generally. So that, that sort of uh, gives us a little bit of an introduction and um, Adrian's, what Adrian's brought along tonight is, is one segment um, of the, the training standard that's become fairly well recognised now internationally. He has um, been here in Australia with one of our uh, life-saving organisations and I've been able to join in on that myself uh, on one occasion. Um, and obviously, um, as you pay, may have picked up, he's also done some work uh, throughout the UK, um, as well as um, a, a lot of uh, development work in uh, North America. So um, the training model it has become quite, um, uh, I guess it's not officially an international standard as such, but it's certainly uh, highly recognised and highly regarded. So um, Adrian's got one sample to take us through. And um, so am I, I think I'm leading, staying on the slideshow, Adrian, is that right? Yeah, if you could, please, mate. Okay. Okay, so, just ask a few questions that was in the chat about, um, uh, just before we move on, about cost. And it's really important. It's a very valuable question about emergency cost. And when you, yes, flood rescue is a very expensive uh, situation. Um, just to give a process of the PPE, and you'll see this in my presentation of the amount of kit you need plus the training and the continual training and the attrition rate of equipment over a period of 10 years needs to be kept in place. So when we look at this in terms of uh, US dollars of say 20, $30,000 to train 20 people up to get fully equipped and, and to be get going, that sounds a lot of money. But if you're, uh, you develop that in towards your instructor cadre to ongoing and develop that and look at government funding, $30,000 is nothing compared to the billions, absolute billions of dollars of flood disaster. And when governments start looking at uh, flood management and flood disaster, about 90% of their budget is taken up on defence. And it's interesting um, that, yes, for example, the previous slides uh, presentation, the sandbags were there, but certainly uh, sandbags won't stop it. It's something we've learned uh, over here in Europe that sandbags end up being overcome and just fill to dirty water. It doesn't stop. Uh, and so at some point you need a very good and safe rescue response, highly trained with a good management system behind it and everybody knowing and how that works and very much taken at the point of yes you do have to practice and and in our previous workshops you get you need to know what your emergency manager's first name is you need to know what your uh, uh, regional manager's uh, first name is because it's no good finding that out on the day it happens you know the four phases that Shane talked about uh, eight weeks ago the first part was preparedness and actually doing all your groundwork and doing your prep work in in planning learning about people relationships and looking at funds to deal with that is critical because when we start raining uh, or when the storms come it's now too late and you're either ready or you're not ready and that investment sounds like a lot in dollars However, that's nothing compared to the economic risk of a person in terms of their own personal life and what they bring to the economy. And if you're losing uh, in, in the Western world, we do look at about a million dollars, million and a half dollars a person brings to the economy. So, you know, you start having loads of people who are a die and have death due to flooding. And that's a statistic we don't know about through to the economic um, dangers of unemployment and long-term health, uh, long-term health and disease, that starts to have a huge impact. So, yes, the government does need to uh, plan an emergency strategy for defence, but in there, it's always recommended 10 to 15 percent of that budget should be in rescue uh, standards. And carrying on with Shane, yes, there, there does need to be a fitness. Uh, standard only a basic but you do need to understand the uh, the capability of swim and the capability of lifting and, and manual handling because some of the research papers we've been involved with is 
when your responders are in flood, they are operating for three, four, five days at a time. And they're effectively burning an, an hour. Uh, they're burning equivalent to anything between a five or a 10 kilometer road race in terms of their movement against the water. So they're burning much more calories than you think. And they're dehydrating very, very quickly of anything from 700 mil to nearly a liter of, of water of sweat uh, per hour. So all these, all these things, need to be in place. So some good questions uh, there. If we could move on to the next slide, Helen, that'd be great. So here are effectively the training modules, which is interesting to listen to um, the feedback from this. Uh, module one is just a day and that's the awareness. It's the absolute foundation of the um, hazards and risk management that goes in place. And everywhere in Europe, and in, in North America and now in Australia will have that inland water safety awareness. It gives uh, basically land-based techniques of, of reach and throw, uh, but it really shows you the point of actually the dangers and the hazards of both flood water and normal water. So it allows you to understand and start to read that those uh, the hydrology and the operations. Module two is a non-technical wade only, uh, and this is kind of up to your uh, thighs, not much more than that in water, and the water isn't really massively moving fast. It's, it's basically what we call in the Western world door knocking, where you just get them, the people out really, really quickly. They may have a floating raft to put people and animals on as well and th that one is probably the most useful if you're preparing early and moving forward uh, and in front of the curve then certainly by using these flood rescue responders they can do an awful lot of the work uh, this is required now module three starts to be where we are really looking at technical and where we talk about it as a swim rescuer, but they also need to understand about lateral rope systems and, and ropes aren't climbing ropes, they're floating ropes and ropes in water are like snakes that haven't got a tether on them. They can get yourself very quickly into um, um, difficulty if you're not really fully aware of how these systems work and operate in water. And it's at this level we start to look at ro very robust technical uh, expertise Things like a vehicle in water uh, would, isn't just as simple as not opening the door and getting them out. There's some really important information there. And that's a four day course to ensure uh, the quality is there. And uh, at least two of those days must be in class two water. So that is speeds up to five kilometers an hour. The flood rescue boat operators course has a prerequisite for the technician because you need to understand that how and because some of those systems will be brought into the boat and um, you also have to have a basic understanding of power boats so those in the life-saving world that's got a power boat course with uh, uh, life-saving south africa or from another uh, life-saving organization is really important because those basic boat skills are the foundations of moving forward but as one of the questions and one of the guests said about hydrology, yes, they, it's apples and pears. Yes, the boat floats. and Yes, the boat goes around in circles. However, flood operations is completely different to surf and completely different to uh, tidal. So there are very specific uh, um, uh, bits that we need to operate from. And in those areas, we push the, the water speed uh, a lot more faster to um, make it tough and get to show how those boats operate and how the team in the boat has to operate as well, which is a unique way, uh, slightly different to you see in the surf break. All this has to be managed. And so therefore a water incident manager needs to make sure team or teams are operating safely. And, and we talked about this in the tactical management strategy and the strategic one, that water incident managers need to be able to put this all together in a risk-based process and to ensure that the standards are in place and safety is there. And that's a very important role. And that's a four day module in itself. For the government levels and emergency responders, module six is the flood tactical advisor. And these are really kind of the top of the uh, tree where they need to understand both emergency statutory as well as volunteer services and how this all works and stitches together about what, what uh, how civil defense might be used to help aid a flood rescue response and the equipment used, how the fire service may be used and how that links into the flood rescue team. So these are very uh, embedded tactical experts 
uh, and a lot of investment in there is spent to make sure that these are there to support the water and some managers and the teams doing the job. And finally, module seven, which is the flood rescue strategic advisor. This is somebody from the very top level, probably a senior officer in the fire or police or civic defense that would help coordinate those resources at a, at a very much strategic level, but also give advice to the government and using a tactical advisor can make sure that they understand the, uh, the amount of work that's being carried out and the amount of support and investment required to provide those assets in the right place. Next slide, please, Helen. Shane. Oh, Shane, sorry, Shane. <laughs> cool. So this is a very, uh, it looks busy, but it just gives you an idea of the training standard for the water flood rescue boat operation. It gives a target group of what they should be and the scope and the aim and the minimum delivery hours that we have to obtain. Uh, and it gives you the safety of the structure ratios as well. And it also gives out the learning outcomes for flood water. And you'll recognize some of those uh, wordings are probably the same stuff that you see in your normal powerboat uh, uh, driving skills. However, you know, I do need to remind you that these skills are not in flat water or not in surf. These are specifically for flood. You know, how are you going to deal with towing in, in you know, 15 knots of speed of water? Uh, and it's not going to be like you would normally do with, um, uh, with your basic skills. How are you going to deal with engine fault finding? How are you going to deal with uh, holding station? And how we are going to um, move out of flood water when the worst thing we can do is try and turn around uh, in a boat because that can be high sided very quickly and actually flip the boat over. So veering down and control of boat lower. So effectively you're in forward gear, but you're actually you're holding the boat uh, in line with the flow, but actually you're reversing down. So there are things that we need to uh, help and teach you with. And in these kind of speeds of water, the area of safety, which we have talked about in the hydrology lecture about eddies being relatively safe, an area of still water. In fact, in boat operations, because the flow is so much more faster, the eddies actually start to work against us where we're in there, but it's trying to kick us back out into that flow. So there's, there's a lot of work uh, in that, but it just gives you a small scope of the amount of training hours, and the, the um, uh, learning outcomes that we need to achieve. Next slide, Shane. So team typing capabilities. This is really important. It goes back to what Shane said earlier on about everybody needs to know what is the standard, what is the amount of equipment, and how are we going to do this? And one of the lessons we learned in, in both in America and we learned in, uh, in, in Europe was uh, when I was doing the, my first big major flood disaster situation back in 98, um, I looked like Clint Eastwood with a load of phones on the table and around my waist. And I was phoning teams that had boats all around the country. And I was trying to find out what boat they had, what size of boat they had, what type of engine, did they have this, did they have that? And I had, I had to grab a load of uh, whiteboards uh, and blackboards to, so we can write stuff on because we had to find all this information. Now that was a lot of work from a group to try and manage all this and certainly was a headache. And what we realized that if we created a team type approach, there were each team, like we are looking at here on the slide, type b which is a water flood rescue boat team they would i would know immediately if they said to me on the phone or on, on an asset register now um, they are type b team i would know they would have a technical water rescue capability they would have an ability to understand in search operations within the water environment they would have good power boat rescue operations and in water operations and flood response and i wouldn't have to worry about uh all the information I was originally asking, because when we go to the next slide in just a second, the detail for a type B gives out a set of requirements that that team must have as a minimum. And then with the type C team, it's a technician's team where, again, they do everything the same, but it's non-powered craft. So they can use paddles with, with boats and rope systems. And you can see how that slide builds across. So by having grouping an ability or a capability means I don't have to make loads and loads of phone calls. I can ensure that 
if someone says to me and they've been audited, what type of type to what uh, type team are you uh, are you calling yourself? Immediately by, by going B, C, or D, immediately I know what that capability is because they've hit that standard. So, what equipment are they going to be carrying? So, next slide, please, Shane. So on this here is what does that type B, B team bring? So we work from top left and across, we've got capability. So what can they do? The logistics of how long they can play for. What is that team structure? Which is really important because part of this is not just asking for a team, but if you're a strategic manager and you're asking for all these teams, say 10 teams of seven, that's 70 people. Well, you've now got to find places to eat, sleep and recover for 70 people. So numbers are really important because when we're moving people around the, the uh, chessboard, we need to look after them at a strategic level. And we can't guess about what numbers they might be. We need proper clear numbers so I can plan about how many people are coming to assist you and how many rooms do we need in a hotel or whatever to make sure that they're fed and watered. What competencies is really important as well and what kind of instant command systems are they trained to deliver? Obviously, transportation and communication, what capability for first aid? Remember what we said about flood water is a biohazard, the decontamination, and also the navigation of stuff. When, and we've got handheld GPS, but actually things now are, are improving where a lot of stuff can be done on the phone. The boat gives out uh, on the left lower side the capability of what the equipment is needing and what should it do and what kind of pub, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, do we expect from our team to turn up? And that isn't just uh, for one team. This is a standard nationally seen both in America, both now in Australia uh, and in Europe. And if a team turns up with any of this missing, then they are removed uh, from that because it's very, very important, as Shane said, that terminology, equipment and training are the same because we can have teams coming from all over the country, if not from other countries. And the only way that we can be a very good commandable uh, rescue resource is if we all understand what we're trying to achieve. And if I'm on one side of the bank and you're on the other and you know what I'm saying in the same terminology, and you have the same kind of equipment and you know what we're trying to achieve, then it, we become a proper rescue resource. If you're different to me, that doesn't work. And then that's where we start to have situations where literally we're putting rescue responders in, the, in, in death's hands. You've got the technical equipment now about what kind of equipment you should be carrying in your tech team and how often you should be testing uh, uh, that equipment as well. So kind of much of a quarterly logs to make sure that you haven't just left it in the bag for six months or a year. You actually are making sure that it's still robust and able to use. Next slide, please, Shane. So just these last few slides are just a few bit of pictures of what this looks like with your continual professional development. So you can see the guys doing non-powered paddling. It's part of, you know, sometimes the water is too shallow to uh, put an engine in, um, but you don't want to be wading in, in that. So nice little picture there of showing uh, the guys breaking out into a flow and practicing their boat paddling skills, often uh, very much overlooked, but actually in flood world, it's really important that you do that. And in the top right hand corner, you can see the, the people there training uh, what we call a tension diagonal line. And that could be used from street to street and, and as much as it looks very urban there, but we could use lamppost to lamppost or tree to tree, uh, whatever we can do to make, get across that water safely um, and using the rope safely to ensure that we don't lose our responders downstream. The middle uh, right hand picture is our boat operations uh, and practicing those boat skills, as we said earlier. And then the final slide is actually using some rescue solutions for dealing with casualties, you know, evacuation, spinal immobilization, and how we can get somebody from a bad place to a good place. Next slide, please, Shane. And here, you know, we don't stop. Uh, with our tactics. Another again is you can use your rafts, which is a top left hand corner, and practice uh, doing that. 
The lower left-hand corner is quite a new uh, thing that I'm sharing with you now. We've learned over during multiple floods that our responders got injured. And, and this was trying to lift people from houses, down the stairs, out through the hall or whatever, uh, and get into the boat. And actually, there was nothing there that would be um, thin enough, but wide enough to look after the victim, but also thin enough to get through doorways. And if we're trying to wade and carry them over our shoulders, all our kit, and we can't see where our feet are, are moving or stepping onto, it becomes very hazardous. So this new type of... Um, uh, aquatic sled stretcher that goes in peace with the saviour stretcher has been absolutely fantastic because they both come together with the victim. It keeps our responders manual handling safe because they're in there for three, four, five, six days. So if you're removing somebody weighing 60, 70, 80 kilograms, and you're, but you're not doing it once, you're imagining that if you're rescuing probably two, 300, 400 times over a week, that load starts to become hazardous on the responders. So anything that we can do to reduce that load and keep our responders in the fight safely has got to be a good thing. So managing manual handling and casualty um, removal is critical. And then moving on to the right, you can see the helicopter operations. And again, flood, boat and uh, rescue technician operations need to practice hand in hand. You need to know you, don't, you, know, you need to practice properly and you need to practice uh, for real because it's no good finding out for real on the day of the flood. So that's a really good picture of us uh, working in North Carolina. And then you can see the casualty evacuation, the types of boats that have been used. Uh, very much we like the rubber duck inflatable, but this boat here on the right is a fantastic flat bottom boat. It's called the R1 Connector. And in, in, in UK, we have 10 of these that can actually, they connect together and we can make pontoons, we can make forward command points, and they are a jet drive boat that actually sits in just 10 centimeters of water and it can carry a palatable load. So um, if you look very carefully in that picture on the uh, left hand side or the top of the boat, you'll see a yellow little square. And in that yellow square actually says um, where the pallets uh, can't go any more forward, which means if you're dealing with medicine, water, fuel cells, food, all this can be done and carried safely. Even cutting gear for the fire service can carry without pinching the boat like the inflatables and doing damage. So, you know, with flood, there's no such thing as one boat does everything. So you need two types of boats. One is the inflatable uh, rubber duck, as the Australians would call it. But you do need a flat bottom boat, rigid, that you can go over barbed wire, trucks, um, things like that. And it can be shallow enough uh, that you can get through. So that's how we do our response. Next slide, please, Shane. I think we're getting there. So really it's for me to invite uh, any questions uh, of, of, of stuff to, to see if that's helped you and understand the training. This is a very short way of, of talking about it, but hopefully you can see that this is uh, quite in depth. Uh, each training uh, level builds on one on top of the other, and certainly the hours need to be there. And hopefully because we're trying to encourage people to be safe be able to risk assess everything as they go and very much as Shane has said that we are able to have the same terminology have the same skills and for international support or regional or national region support then when people are coming in they are the same way trained uh, and this is really important in, in, the, in America the west coast and east coast can never meet up and all of a sudden they have a flood and they can bring hundreds of teams in and all of a sudden they have a proper national resource, all understanding the job and all trained to the same standard. It's exactly the same in the UK. Europe, we've just set those standards. It takes going to take a little bit more work there. And we did the first time in Tasmania last year where we put these standards there for them to start training to these standards. So I hope you've enjoyed that and got a small insight to those. Are there any questions? All quiet, that's good. That concludes me. Uh, thank you very much, Shane. I'll hand it back to you, mate. Thank you. So uh, just a final plug there. Um, 
for that uh, link for the, everyone that's participated. Um, hopefully, we know from the first survey that there's certainly more um, feedback and communication from those that uh, are sitting there um, at this stage. So I'll just turn that off. And we are now back uh, over to you, Mizzy. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for everyone. Uh, Dr. Amy just shared a link uh, where you guys, I would like you guys to click on and be able to, to, to fill in that survey. This is the post survey after the, we have uh, attended the, a number of sessions. Even if this is your first session, I would like you guys to actually uh, click on the link and be able to fill in that particular survey. Maybe. Sorry, it's Adrian here. I just did a question on, uh, and it would be okay if you could answer that on the question, if I could. Okay. If I could There's one about question about prop guards, about surf prop guards. So yes, the surf prop guard works, and it works very well in flood. And we found that the four-bladed surf prop, as in used in New Zealand, has been better uh, against the white water than the three-blade prop. Um, however, there is now test being done with a pump jet engine. Now that's not a jet drive, it's a pump jet, which is encased in Pella. We've been testing that. It was originally, it was never on the market because it was a special forces uh, one and it was only used for a certain group of people. But now, they've, um, now that that has relaxed, um, it means that the rescue teams are able to buy one that can go off, off the back of the, or exchange the 30 or 40 horsepowers can be changed out from a normal prop and surf prop guard into a uh, um, pump jet engine, which uh, actually doesn't, um, um, it actually doesn't reduce any of the um, speeds and there's no cavitation with that. So I hope that's answered the question. Thank you, Mizzy. A question? Thank you. Anyone have a question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for awesome presentation. My question is, I have seen a very detailed program, which is a training program, fantastic. My question is, who will be the owner of the program? Like I, if I write something from training in Kenya, it is Kenya Life Saving Federation. Now in this case, who owns the flood training program? So to answer that, the, when what we did with Australia and what we've done with other life saving organizations is um, we would um, like we, an example is Tasmania in Australia. What we did is there are not international and national standard. And so in terms of what we do under the National Fire and Protection Agency, the NFPA. And so um, in order to have a proper audit, because you could do something, but then, you know, without understanding properly what those flood standards are and what they mean and being trained, the danger is that you could hurt yourself or loss of life. And, you know, you'd be right back to where we were back in the 1990s, where in the UK, we killed firefighters and America killed firefighters. And that had to stop. So, um, so what would be the, the, the correct way would probably be, and the safest way and show national audit is generally a team of instructors from a swift water background who are accredited will drop in like we did with Surf Life Saving Australia, did a lot of work over the last three years dropping in to develop the instructor cadre, they got signed off and it becomes theirs. And then, the, and then the, that relationship is always supported but it's now down to Surf Life Saving Tasmania to continue with those standards. Uh, any other question? Well, from my side, you've presented a number of about seven modules. What then happens if ever, let's say, Life Saving Kenya is very much interested in terms of attending? those seven modules or attending one of the modules, is there a way that the training can be provided to Life Saving Kenya or Life Saving Tanzania or any other stakeholder that is very much interested? What are the most effective way to make sure that this particular training are actually delivered to, to those who are interested, who are outside your borders as in Australia or in UK? Thank you. Um, yeah, so, 
I think if I heard the question correctly, how can that be supported and what's beneficial? The most, I think the first step in stones is to, you, after all this, is to go and have a chat with your uh, colleagues, or people uh, strategic and, and fund holders uh, and asset management, and as well as the uh, governance of your organizations decide, you know, do you wish to go forward and at what level to go forward with? Um, the thing that the, the investment part of that is, you know, when we start going down with flood, it's, it can't be a wetsuit and it can't be, you know, a life jacket, things like that. There has to be proper PPE. Uh, we know that, again, to reiterate that we've killed people. So we know what works. We know why it doesn't work, um, because we've all been hit by uh, government improvement notices. And it's because of errors and mistakes from the early days uh, that we didn't know either. So um, so the easiest thing is, is to, first of all, decide if you wish to do it and what kind of funding strategy you need, because we get to a point where the chicken and egg, where a group of people could come over uh, and that's easy. But if you haven't got the equipment there um, and then, then it becomes difficult. So uh, and you can't hit those standards with that equipment and moving water. So the first thing is, is there funds to put to do this? Is there funds to um, uh, get the PPE? And are there areas where you can use that is or like a white water park or something like that that could be used or a river that's relatively safe? Um, that you could use um, to get that training in. And some of these questions will take a while to answer. And then once you've got these answers, uh, I'm sure Shane and I can uh, uh, help you uh, about, you know, coming over. I mean, but uh, but it's just those, those, those kind of big questions that you need to ask first before getting too excited. It's very often we see this where you see the toy shop, we want to do it, but actually we've got to put some groundwork first. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, Helen, in the chat room, do we have any questions? I don't see um, any other questions that have not yet been answered. Okay. Well, with that being said, I would like to thank everyone who has uh, participated in the four last uh, sessions. And I would like to thank our presenters who made uh, taking their time to actually prepare this presentation and share their knowledge uh, with us with the aim to educate everyone. I, I think it is uh, webinars of this nature that uh, uh, make us better, make, uh, make us better rescuers, uh, make us better lifesavers. And, uh, and I, want, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, before we close off, uh, please don't forget uh, the, the, to, to, to click on the link for the survey where you can actually answer all the questions that, that are there. Uh, so I would like to encourage everyone to make sure that you actually go through those particular survey because of this is the same survey that you'll be able to assist us in terms of providing a research, uh, a research outcome that will be able to assist us further in terms of uh, finding out how can we be serviced better. And I also, I would like to also uh, just, uh, since today is the last uh, uh, session, uh, however, we'd like to also encourage people that to continue to engage with one another, to continue to participate uh, and stay in touch uh, with one another. One of the aims that we were having this webinar to be set up was not only just to share information, was only, not only to share knowledge or educate members, but also to build uh, networks across each other, so that when we have uh, uh, these particular disasters, we are able to, to 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 know who can I contact and what kind of information that I will be able to to get from who. So it's a collaborative uh, strengthening uh, effort that we are having this particular uh, webinars. So I'm hoping members will be able to share information with one another. Will be able to make sure that. Uh, uh, they would have contacts that of people that they would be calling when this particular disaster strikes. And of course, there are a number of things that we have learned uh, from, from, from the first session up until to the last. And I would like to thank everyone who have participated from the first session up until to the last session. And I don't want to keep you guys any longer. And, uh, uh, and uh, Shane, uh, th thank you so much uh, for, 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 for all the hard work together with Andy, uh, where you, in fact, we thought this was gonna be just a once off session. And then you have prepared us to make sure that it, it's very much uh, uh, intensive 
where we ended up having four different sessions instead of one particular session. And we'd like to thank you uh, for that, together with your research team, team members who were playing a very important role uh, behind the scenes in terms of making sure that you are able to find ways of educating each other. I would like to also to thank South African delegates who also presented here uh, uh, in this particular platform, the delegates from Mozambique as well, who also presented in this particular platform. I'd like to thank you so much. And indeed, the number of people who actually attended, not only just South Africa, there are people from Tanzania, from Kenya, from Egypt, from India, and uh, from all over the from all over the many different countries. And I would like to thank those particular people. And, uh, and, uh, and it is important to note that even though that we have a number of challenges, especially in other, in other countries in terms of the lack of, of equipment, uh, the lack of government uh, response in terms of making sure that they're able to assist. I am sure together we can always find strategies where we can start engaging this particular government because of uh, having these particular rescues. It costs so much money, it costs so much, and then there's nothing that we can do on our own. There is a way that we need to find that how do we start engaging our governments so that they are becoming aware of these particular issues that we are facing as an, as an organization that is busy with, uh, with, with rescues and all of that. And with that being said, I am not sure if whether um, Daya is still here, if you'd glad like to say some few words. If not, uh, thank you so much for attending and I wish you all the best uh, in the future endeavors. And those who are going to bed now, uh, good night. For those who are just waking uh, up now, good morning. MZ, um, if, if you don't mind, I would also um, like to uh, express our appreciation. Go ahead. MZ. Okay, thank you. Um, I also would like to extend thanks to um, Roy Lifesaving, particularly the President um, Clive Holland, who also uh, facilitated in, in running this webinar with our uh, presenters, uh, uh, Shane Baker and Adrian Mayhew. So thanks go to um, Royal Life Saving. We will engage with Royal Life Saving further to look at uh, future training uh, um, initiatives. So thank you very much uh, for that. And I would also like to um, say to all participants, uh, particularly those in South Africa, we will be planning a South African uh, um, uh, uh, sort of acknowledgement of the Global Drowning Prevention Day. 25th of July. So we will contact you about uh, what are some of the events that we would plan for that particular day. Uh, and hopefully we can all join hands because at the end of the day, um, these are the kind of uh, advocacy um, actions that will prompt our government, uh, particularly in South Africa, to support uh, organizations that, uh, that, that, that are uh, at the front line of uh, humanitarian efforts, as Irene has reminded us. So we will be contacting you in, in, in the weeks running up to the 25th of July. And thank you very much, MZ and Helen from Life Saving South Africa for all of the uh, work behind the scenes. Uh, much appreciated. And I pause there. Thank you, everyone. And goodbye and farewell. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Safe day. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Cheers, all. There's a lot to reflect on now. Thank you. Bye-bye.